Hello and welcome to The Print. My name is Soumya Pillai. I'm a senior assistant editor covering space and science for The Print. Now, the recent trip of Indian Air Force Group Captain Shubhanshu Shukla has reignited space ambitions among Indians. But what we do know about Group Captain Shukla's trip is that he required months of rigorous training to go into his mission. But what if I told you that you and I can actually get into a space capsule and go to space? You might be thinking that this is a bluff that I am throwing at you, but we do have the founders of Sera who are planning to make this happen. And we also have uh, an astronaut uh, from Sera as well, who actually went ahead through Sera on his uh, first space mission. I have with me today the founders of Sera Space Exploration and Research Agency, uh, Sam Hutchinson and Joshua uh, Skirla. I also have astronaut uh, Victor Hespana today with me to talk about this uh, mission that uh, is going to get India its first citizen astronaut. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I'm going to jump right to the question, guys. Uh, first, before uh, you know, getting into the details of the mission, uh, you know, if if Sam and Joshua, you could tell us a little bit about what Sera is. What do you guys do in Sera, and what exactly is the aim that Sera has for space travel? I'm happy to answer. So, Sera was founded as a as a space agency for everyone. Um, historically. Space agencies have been sort of founded and run by uh, entire nations um, that pursue the national interests of those nations. And Sarah is a space agency that is for all nations and for everyone. Um, and that in particular is about opening up both human space exploration itself and also scientific research related to space to the broadest and widest possible global community. So. The way that our missions work is that we organize for um, launch services, in this case with uh, Blue Origin, who have a fantastic rocket called the New Shepard. Um, this is a suborbital rocket, so it flies uh, to space and back um, in a single morning. Uh, and we make that launch available to the public. So in the case of this mission, um, we're focused on six seats because there are six seats in the capsule. Um, one of those seats is for anybody on the planet and the other five seats have been allocated to specific uh, regions or nations that have had few or no astronauts or no sort of commercial or, or private citizen astronauts, in this case, India. So we make that flight available through what's called the Sarah Mission Control app, which is a, an application that lives inside Telegram. And anybody can sign up and apply to be an astronaut and um, propose a science experiment to be taken aboard the flight. And what we do that is so different to the way that space agencies have historically been run is that we open it up to everyone and we let the public decide who actually gets to fly. So the process for selecting both astronauts and experiments is a democratic one. Um, and when you sign up for the app, you know, you either propose yourself as a candidate um, and you end up like Victor, you know, hopefully in space, or you can support friends, you know, vote for them through a series of sort of phase mark, you know, phased um, selection processes that we're going to be running over the next few months. Um, but the important thing is that is that we make it available to the public, and the public decide who gets to fly and what experiments those astronauts perform in space. So it's a it's a very different model to how space exploration and research has has functioned in the past. Uh, Joshua, maybe you'd want to step in my next question, like Sam has already touched upon it about what the mission is going to look like. But if you could dive a little deeper into, uh, like, you know, he said that there, there are going to be six seats, one is going to be reserved for India. Um, how did you choose India and what is the entire process going to look like? Because today you actually release the platform on which citizens can actually enroll. So can anybody enroll? Is it going to be like, you know, can somebody like me enroll? What is it going to take to, you know, what is the process going to look like? If you could just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So today we will open up the platform for everyone to join. Effectively, you're joining a community, which we call the collective. This community will give you the opportunity to follow on on one of two different paths or three paths, essentially. 
So one, you could uh, elect to become an astronaut candidate. Uh, number two, you could elect to pursue your own research uh, endeavor by way of our platform. And number three, you could choose to do neither of those two and just participate as a supporter by selecting either the astronauts or the things that get to fly. So we have six seats, as you mentioned. Each seat has it comes with its own payload space. So we plan to run the experiments in that payload space, and some of the experiments will actually be carried by the astronauts themselves. So it's not just about the spectacle here. We have substance that's going to be driving it. We also, as you mentioned, have six seats, right? One of the seats is for India. Four other seats are assigned to countries that have had few or no astronauts in the past. And that is uh, really about us connecting with a specific geography, having communications in that market, and empowering a nation to find this representative to send potentially the first individual from that country. The sixth seat is then open to anyone from anywhere. So that allows us to be inclusive and allow people from all over that don't come from one of the partner countries to also compete for a seat, thereby really creating a global community around this mission. We intend for this mission to not just be a once off. We intend for this mission to be a, you know, a, an, an annual basis in the least. And you know we've chosen India because India is an incredible powerhouse as a space nation already. There are you know uh, there's several you know missions as of late that have been very successful. There are big ambitious missions that are upcoming. There is a lot of activity in the private sector, both in terms of foreign direct investment and uh, and domestic investment into projects that are developing technologies that will service the global demand for space technology needs in the future. And so we want to help shift awareness that. Uh, space can be for everybody today. And by working with a country like India that has millions and millions of uh, st uh, STEM students that can participate in this, it helps them start to think about ways that they can get their payload to space or potentially send themselves to space, bringing back a whole new legacy for space travelers and uh, space curious across India. Uh, so what's the training going to look like? Because uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that, you know, uh, like we had... Uh, our first astronaut, uh, Rakesh Sharma, and then very recently, Shubhanshu Shukla, who went to space. Both of them required like months, in some cases, years to, you know, prepare for uh, a trip to space. But being a citizen astronaut, uh, what is the kind of training that we are looking at? The best person to ask is, is Victor, who is our, who was our first astronaut. He has first-hand experience of, of what that process is like. Yeah, Victor, yeah. what did your training look like? And, you know, you, you now have uh, completely uh, come on board with Sarah. So, uh, you know, are you also going to be training these astronauts? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think the best answer for you is uh, it's uh, space is being accessible for everyone now. And this is just because of the, especially of the, the technology of the re reusable rockets, like uh, the New Shepard one which is the rocket the astronaut is going to, uh, to fly. Uh, so the rocket, it's 100% autonomous. That, so in this case, we don't need to have like a, a pilot in, in this rocket. Uh, it's uh, autonomous. So that's why we can uh, have like a, a short training. And another thing, this is a suborbital flight, uh, which is a, a difference for, for uh, those flights going to the, the ISS, to the International Space Station, for example. So th because of that, of this kind of, of accessibility, the, the train goes for like a one week before in the Blue Origin facility. Uh, it is very accurate for the, this kind of, of uh, flight. And uh, everyone inside of the rocket uh, could, could see uh, the view, I uh, feel the, the the weightlessness feeling. It's it's amazing. I, I would say the the training is the best best fit to have an amazing experience inside of the rocket. So that's it. Well, Victor, if you could tell our viewers a little bit about your background as well. I mean, do you yeah. have a background? Uh, you know, I, I were you already trained to be an astronaut? Uh, no. I mean, what I've read is that you're a civil engineer. You're just twenty eight. But if you could just tell us about your educational background uh, and also, uh, like, you know, did you ever think that you're going to be traveling to space at such a young age? 
Yeah, yeah. Honestly, no. My background is in production engineer. I was I used to work as a, a project project manager in a private equity firm in Brazil. And honestly, I I never thought it was possible to uh, someday to go to space like I did. It was something very very distant for me. I I always say that in Brazil the the the, the nearest uh launch site it's about two two thousand kilometers from my my home so uh it was uh, really impossible for me when i heard about Sarah, it, it was an amazing experience to jump in uh in the a strong community to learn more about space but at that moment i i i didn't yeah i i thought okay this is just for maybe to understand more about the the, the new space economy but I, I i didn't realize it it could be possible at that moment and i was uh probably selected to, to uh for for uh randomly in 22 and it was like a fantastic for me and uh i yeah i became like a, a living living example about what space could be in in the future so that's why we are working in in the same way now to to have the same accessibility for uh regular people you know yeah sam and joshua i just wanted to bring you guys in uh with the question of how did sera happen because especially in a country like india we always you know associate the space program with the national space program We've never really had, uh, you know, citizen sign up for uh, space missions. But uh, uh, Sam, you still have a background in space. But Joshua, uh, I mean, how how did Sarah happen, and what was the larger goal that you guys want to achieve through Sarah? I think the 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 biggest shift, as Victor has already um, described, is the reduction in cost of space access. So. Historically, the only way to get to space was on, you know, big expendable rockets that went all the way, you know, to, to space station. Um, they were extremely expensive when I was growing up. It, you know, it's 250, 300, 350 million dollars uh, per launch. Um, they're expendable, and that's part of the reason they cost so much. Um, and you've obviously seen a number of companies, and there are companies, um, excellent companies, even in India, who are working on re usable rocket technology and that has brought down the cost of accessing space um, and it's also increased the frequency with which you can go and the availability of six years to organize um, taking a payload or, or, or certainly a human to space and these days is you can call up at relatively short notice and organize something uh, as an individual as a private company as a private citizen and that's a huge shift and we're only at the beginning of seeing how the private sector is going to utilize this cheaper, more accessible space launch. And Sarah is, you know, I think an early example of what happens when you see that shift away from purely national entities operating in space towards private individuals and private corporations. So the, the dream of, of, of Sarah is to continue to utilize these new and evolving technologies to make space something that is part of everyday life for ordinary citizens not just in terms of utilization of space assets and you know we all use cell phones and satellites every day in an embedded way but actually shifting over to a much more um, explicit involvement of private citizens and everyday people in uh, space exploration and research and i think the dream is that you also see a shift in terms of the kind of people who go and the kind of experimentation that you do in space. So when you shift from that national government sort of controlled selection process, you know, I think your one of your earlier questions was, can I go? Can anyone go? Yes, anyone. If you're over 18, if you're human and you want to go to space and you're an Indian citizen, you can join the mission today and have a chance uh, to, to, to fly on the New Shepard rocket. Um, it, you don't have to be um, a jet pilot, a fighter pilot, uh, uh, an esteemed scientist or an esteemed technologist or engineer. And that's important because when you send highly technical people to do highly technical things, um, they have technical perspective on the experience. And I think one of the things that we learned from Victor 
is that when you set, send someone who is, let's say, more of an everyday citizen, um, they're able to communicate that experience of what it's like to be in space to other everyday people in a way that they can connect with and a way that they can understand. And, you know, one of the objectives that we have is to encourage young people today to start down the path of a career in STEM and engineering, because if you're in your late teens or early 20s today and you pursue a career in space, at the rate the new space economy is growing, you could be realistically living and working in space in 10, 15, 20 years from now. It's going to expand so enormously over the next few decades as a function of this um, reusability and lower cost. So people should be excited. Um, Sarah should, you know, our, our ambition is to be the gateway for young people to get into the space industry, to get into the sector and ultimately to go to space themselves. Uh, Sam and Joshua, do, do you have a date in mind for this particular mission? And if you could also tell us uh, plans about the future missions of Sarah. We certainly do have a date in mind and we're not necessarily allowed to share that. Blue Origin keeps the flight schedule very close to their, uh, to their team. And we know roughly when we are expected to fly and we're organizing and orchestrating our marketing communications campaign and community building exercise around that goal. Uh, we certainly would like to see this particular type of mission repeated on an annual basis. And then we have more ambitious plans when we look at uh, orbital opportunities, other types of research missions. Those things are all things that will be coming online as we look into the near future. But for now, suborbital lends us an opportunity to give access to everyone, to both the science and the human spaceflight component um, at an accessible, more accessible price point than orbital. And I think as you heard in Sam's previous answer, when we're talking about the genesis of Sarah, we're really thinking about a community building exercise and how we can aggregate demand for the new launch technology that is on the market. So as much demand as we can surface within our community, we can take that off from the suppliers in the market and do more interesting things with it. Uh, Sam, Victor, Joshua, my last question to you all, especially because we're talking about this particular mission and we are very excited that India is going to be a part of it. But if you could just tell us how long is this process going to be like, uh, you know, uh, once now that you've opened the portal, how long are you going to keep it open for? How long till the screening process happens? So between today's launch and till, you know, the final selection, how long is it going to take? So without giving up too much information, what we can say is that the process is open now. It will be open for a number of weeks. It will not be open for a number of, let's say, multiple months, right? So there will be three phases of the process and we'd like to see it all resolved towards the end of the year. But we're going to first go through the communication process, which we're doing with you now, open the portal, which we're doing today, start to aggregate that community, once that process is consolidated, then we'll move on to the second phase. So individuals will then pick their track if they want to become astronaut candidates and ultimately reach out to their followers, their supporters within the community to earn their votes to become that astronaut, right? To become that representative. And the same process will unfold. So we'll keep you informed as we go through each phase. So we're announcing today that this is the start of phase one. And ultimately we'll give a heads up when phase one is coming to a conclusion and phase two is beginning. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Sam, Victor, and Joshua. Uh, thank you so much for our viewers to, who took the time and tuned in for this interview. Uh, we are going to leave in the link of the Telegram uh, site that uh, Sarah has opened today. So if you guys want to check it out and also a link to their website to check out the amazing work that Sarah has been doing in encouraging citizen, uh, you know, citizens to go to space in, in easy space missions. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, at The Print for more such science content. Keep tuning in. Thanks for having thank us. You.